Being profitable is virtually useless for modern companies. Founders don't care about profit, shareholders don't care about profit, and even employees don't care about profit. This has resulted in an era of money-losing giants. In the last 12 months, Zillow lost $101 million, WeWork lost $2.7 billion, Snapchat lost $1.43 billion, and Uber lost, wait for it, $9.1 billion. Traditionally, such losses would be a nightmare for owners. If they don't turn around the company soon, bankruptcy would be a high probability. But modern companies don't really care. What they all care about instead is growth and lots of it. As long as the company is growing, any loss is deemed acceptable. It's not just these new startups that have been going down this path either. Tech giants have been using this strategy for decades. Amazon, for example, has always teetered on the edge of profitability, and their retail business is still unprofitable to this day. A similar story can be said about Google as well. Google is a cash cow, but that's only due to one business, their ad business. Virtually everything else is a loss. Their cloud business, for example, lost $480 million last quarter. And as for Facebook, I mean, do I even have to say anything about the metaverse? Some more legacy companies have also turned to this strategy in recent times like Disney. While Disney is still profitable as a company, they're definitely using the modern approach when it comes to new services like Disney+. Plus. Despite having hundreds of millions of subscribers, Disney streaming lost $1.5 billion in the last quarter alone. And it's not like these companies are forced into losses. Most of them could raise prices, cut marketing, lower reinvestments, and become profitable basically overnight. But they actively choose not to because one, they can afford it, and two, they actually think that it's the better play long term. It wasn't always like this though. Back in the day, profit was king. Owners needed profit to pay themselves, they needed profits to pay shareholders, and they needed profits to pay employees bonuses and additional perks. So whether you were running an oil business or a steel business, the goal was to achieve profitability as quickly as possible. But over time, the urgency to reach profitability slowly withered away. Instead of having a 3, 6, or 12 month timeline to reach profitability, owners started having 2, 5, 10 year long timeframes. And now, it seems like this time frame has expanded to encompass infinity. So here's the story of how everyone involved in a company from shareholders to employees slowly accepted indefinite losses. While this acceptance of no profit and losses may seem like a new trend, it's actually been developing for 100 years and dates back to World War I. Such large-scale wars are naturally full nation efforts. So it's not surprising that the government expected everyone to step up and offer their knowledge and expertise to the government. This of course included companies and their executives who were especially important in scaling production, managing logistics, and negotiating deals with contractors. But there was just one problem. Laws prevented the government from accepting services from unpaid volunteers. But with that being said, the government also wasn't willing to pay these executives a substantial salary because one, they were already rich, and two, this was more of a service than a job. So they would eventually settle on paying these executives $1 salaries. Some of the earliest examples of this were Bernard Barak, Robert S. Brookings, and Herbert Bayard Swope, who all served on World War I advisory commissions. This practice just became even more common during World War II, with even more notable people participating in the $1 a year service. Likely the best example of this was William Knudsen, who was the CEO of GM. But after the war came to a close and the US entered one of the most prosperous periods of its history, the $1 salary was more or less forgotten about. And it wasn't until the 1970s that we would see another resurgence of this trend. The automobile industry would be hit hard by the 1970s. Not only was there ludicrous amounts of inflation, but the Middle East would join forces and impose a devastating oil embargo on the US and most Western countries. To make things worse, Japanese cars were also starting to gain popularity. The American automotive company that was likely hurt the most was Chrysler. By the late 1970s, the company was on the 
brink of bankruptcy and was in dire need of a bailout. So Chrysler CEO Lee Iacocca would begin lobbying Congress for a bailout. And to show that he was serious about turning around the company and not just pocketing a bailout, he would offer to take a $1 salary. Chrysler would end up receiving the bailout and Iacocca would stage one of the biggest turnarounds the automotive industry has ever seen. But the biggest sticking factor for many of his peers was not his business excellence, but his $1 salary. You see, back in the 70s and early 80s, taxes were really bad. In fact, if you made more than $215,000 per year, you had to pay income tax of 70%. But long-term capital gains tax was much more reasonable at 28%. So for obvious reasons, founders trended towards decreasing their cash compensation and increasing their stock compensation. They didn't take this to the extreme of taking $1 salaries, but this is eventually where it led to with Steve Jobs. When Steve Jobs returned to Apple in the late 1990s, he would accept a $1 salary. He didn't do this to decrease taxes or earn more stock compensation or really any financial reason. Rather, he was trying to make a statement that he was there to save Apple, not to make money. But it didn't take long for other tech CEOs to make this into a trend. From their perspective, this was a win-win-win-win scenario. They could reduce public criticism about their salaries. Boards could approve stock compensation plans at a magnitude that was simply impossible with cash. Stock had extraordinary growth potential, and founders and CEOs could get away with paying far less in taxes. Now, of course, these leaders still had to make sure the company was profitable because that's what kept the stock price high. But this was quickly changing as well because the next domino to fall were shareholders. Traditionally, one of the most attractive features of stock was their dividend. This makes sense as this is what really makes you feel like an owner of the company. Every quarter, you get a share of the company's profits. This is why many traditional companies like Exxon and Coca-Cola swear by their dividend payments. Exxon has paid dividends for 112 years and they haven't even missed a single payment. This isn't to say that Exxon was always performing well though. In fact, in many years like 2020, they were actually doing quite bad. But they paid a dividend anyway because like I said, they swear by it. Historically, dividends are what attracted investors like Warren Buffett to a stock. The big benefits of exempting dividends would go to fellows like me and Charlie, you know, and that's not going to stimulate the economy, it's going to stimulate us. So maintaining a pristine dividend reputation was vital for such companies. We should also mention that for many stocks, this was their primary return. I mean, steel companies and insurance companies weren't going to double every year. More realistically, they were going to grow 5 or 10% for a few decades and then top out. So the dividend is what made stocks like AT&T, which hasn't moved in 30 years, worth owning. But all of this would change with the internet. Suddenly, companies were able to grow 100% every year for 10 years straight and then grow 50% every year for the next 10 years. And the company that really solidified this notion was none other than Amazon. While Amazon's retail business was never that profitable, they did find a gold mine called Amazon Web Services. If Jeff Bezos really wanted to, he could have leaned in on AWS, raised the prices of Prime a bit, and started paying out solid dividends. But this made no sense to Jeff. You see, Jeff had already subscribed to the idea of no cash compensation for himself. He took a very modest salary of $81,840 throughout his entire career at Amazon. For Jeff, the money was in the stock, not the bottom line and he wanted investors to get on the same page. Fortunately for Jeff, there was a new but rapidly growing subset of investors called growth investors who were getting on the same page. Most of these investors weren't fans of dividends and they saw dividends as a complete waste of capital due to taxes. If you didn't know, dividends are taxed twice, once at the corporate level and once at the investor level. This means that if Amazon was gonna pay $1 in dividends, they would first have to pay about 25% in corporate tax, meaning that only 75 cents would make it to the investor. From there, the investor would have to pay personal income tax on that 75 cents. And given that most investors with a sizable stake are already pretty well off, they usually have to pay 40% of this dividend to taxes. 
And yes, I know that some companies are able to pay tax-exempt dividends, but that's not always the case, so bear with me here. With the 40% income tax, the investor is only left with a mere 45 cents. The worst part is that many of these investors are just looking to reinvest the dividends anyway. So it makes no sense for Amazon to pay out a dividend only for the government to take 55% and then have 45% to come back to Amazon. Instead, Amazon can just reinvest 100% of the profits themselves, and that's exactly what Amazon has done. For the longest time, value investors would ridicule Amazon and these so-called growth investors. But over the past 10 years, growth stocks have taken over the market. Most of the big tech companies pay little to no dividends, and all of the returns for investors are from growth. And since then, even Warren Buffett has opted to invest in Amazon. So there was only one more group to convert to the dark side, employees. Like shareholders, employees have historically trended towards profitable companies. After all, for employees, joining a company isn't just an investment, it's their livelihoods. Also, traditionally, employees used to stick around at the same company for their entire careers. So choosing a stable company with large profit margins was essential. But over time, employees have become more and more risk tolerant. For one, employees no longer feel that they're tied down to one company. In fact, they've realized that their peers who constantly switch companies tend to earn a lot more money. So employees today are a lot more likely to join a startup or a company that's trying to stage a turnaround. Sure, it might not work, but in that case, they can just find another job. If it does work though, they suddenly become a key member at this new company, maybe even an executive. But nowadays, you don't even have to become an executive to cash in on many of the same perks like stock compensation. Historically, employees may have refused to take stock compensation because it's inherently riskier. But as we said, employees are willing to take a lot more risk nowadays. Not to mention, they're a lot more aware of how the wealthy people make their money. They see the Fortune 500 list, they see billionaires, and they see YouTube videos like this. And they realize that if they want to become truly wealthy, they have to own assets like real estate and stock. So naturally, more and more employees started looking and asking for stock compensation. For companies, this was a godsend. As we discussed, it's way easier for companies to pay stock compensation than pay cash compensation. This is the main reason that compensation at big tech companies is so high. Unless you're at an entry level, 50% or more of the compensation is stock. The best part for companies was that they didn't even have to convince employees to take stock compensation. Employees were literally asking for it. And with that, the last domino had fallen. None of this is to say that companies want to lose money, but they are more tolerant of losses than ever before. And as long as there's more growth to achieve, companies are willing to stay at break-even operations indefinitely. A great example of this is Salesforce. Every single year, their revenue has gone up, but their net income is virtually nothing in comparison to their revenue. A similar story can be seen with Shopify and Amazon and Uber and Airbnb and Zillow and basically every modern tech company that you can think of. As long as the company is growing, neither the employees nor the founders nor the shareholders care about profit. For all three of these groups, having the company make no money is counterintuitively the most lucrative option as no money is being siphoned by taxes and everything can be reinvested into further growth. Now, we should also mention that many of these companies are starting to realize that there's no such thing as infinite growth, but that's a whole nother story. If you ran a company, would you go after profit or growth? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you would like to see more videos about tech companies and their inner workings. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.